ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Finlay. I'm the president and, and CEO here at Stimson. It, you know, it's always a pleasure, of course, to welcome anyone from outside of Stimson to Stimson as a, as a guest speaker, especially when they are innovative and imaginative, as all of our guest speakers are. But it's an especially uh, great pleasure to, to welcome those individuals when they're family. And our guest speaker today really is family to us here at Stimson. Now, she may think of us as the weird relatives that live uh, in the attic, but, uh, but uh, the truth is, of course, that, that Rosa's uh, uh, relationship with Stimson dates back uh, uh, a good number of years, and it really began with uh, uh, her co-chairmanship of, of this uh, task force that she uh, uh, ran here at Stimson uh, with, uh, with General uh, John Abizade on a topic that uh, is certainly near and dear to our heart and our project director of this particular effort, uh, who is also responsible for this event today, uh, is, is joining us uh, as well, Rachel Stoll, who directs our, our conventional defense efforts here at Stimson. Um, I think with uh, the publication, we're not going to talk about this report today, by the way, <laughs> Rosa. Yeah, you may, you that may. It's a good report. Uh, but it was a good report, <laughs> yeah. and, and it, it was especially good, I think, because in an era of such intense partisanship and and discord and rancor over virtually every issue, um, the, including this one. Um, uh, Rosa really led this, uh, this group along with, uh, with General Abizade, uh, doing what I think Stimson does best, which was generate a, a truly nonpartisan report that is pragmatic in nature, and I think has and will have a lasting debate on, uh, on a lasting impact on on this particular on this particular issue. We are not going to talk about this, as I say uh, today, but instead we're going to talk about Rosa's latest project. And uh, so, without further ado, uh, Rosa, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming Thanks, back Brian. to Stimson. And I am going to leave you in the capable hands of my boss and our chairman of the board, Ambassador Link Bloomfield. Link. Brian, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming here and joining me and Rosa to talk about this exciting and really interesting and fascinating book, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything, Tales from the Pentagon. Um, I had a lot of fun reading it. It's extremely stimulating. It certainly starts a conversation that needs to be started. And the question is, uh, where does the conversation end? I, I compliment you on the book and congratulate you for starters. As I looked at this and I read this book, I was thinking, there's a lot of mention of Blurred Lines. I was thinking about the, the song, Blurred Lines, that, that, was, uh, that triggered a, actually a uh, plagiarism suit. And so I went to, I was, I was trying to what see you whether, trying to say, Link? Uh, be, not being a lawyer, and therefore not being particularly disciplined in, when matters of law, um, I, I was looking at Marvin Gaye's lyrics for the song for which Blurred Lines was, uh, was taken to court to see if there was anything in the sort of history of law. I really don't want Marvin Gaye to sue me. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I'm not sure that I'm finding in, in your very erudite rendition of sort of the, the path of civilization, the evolution of law, the evolution of norms of justice. I'm not sure that this tracks. It does have a lot of things that I can't repeat here. Um, so maybe... I won't repeat his lyrics here, actually. <laughs> yeah, it would be better if you would sing them. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I used to go to parties and stand around because I was too nervous to really get down. That might have been the early years of the Republic. Uh, but my body yearned to be free. I got up on the floor and thought someone could choose me. No more standing there beside the walls. I got done myself. I got myself together, and now I'm having a ball. Well, that could describe the way legal scholarship operated at the height of uh, the recent troubles, in the sense that they sort of said, whatever we need to do, we'll find a way to say yes. Is that a fair statement? I think that is definitely a fair statement. I think that the post 9-11 uh, uh, answer from certainly US executive branch lawyers was, what do you want to do? No worries, it's legal. Well, when you're not the highest ranking official, yeah. it's usually you can't do that. So I always made it a practice if I knew that something needed to be done and that there would be risk. I always had two lawyers in the room. And that assured that at some point their, their intellectual vanity would lead to a point where they couldn't quite agree on the fine points 
uh, and the precedents, and at the end it was always the same answer, which is it's a political call. We haven't done this before, there's political risk, and I'd say thank you very much. And oftentimes we would take the political risk. Um, I, I want to talk about some elements of the book, but I first want to ask you about the author of the book. So you came from a background, probably not terribly unlike mine, that your story about the Pinochet uh, murder uh, of Orlando Letelier in Washington and some colleagues of your mother uh, as a seminal event. But you came from a world where you found yourself married to the Army and working in the Pentagon. Uh, was that a sort of a, a surprise in the course of your life to find yourself in that world? Yeah, in some ways. I mean, one of the things the book talks about very briefly is it's not completely a foregone conclusion that I would end up working at the Pentagon or married to a, an army officer. Uh, I came from a left-wing anti-war family. One of my earliest memories is sitting on a picnic blanket in the grass in New York Central Park uh, celebrating the end of the Vietnam War in 1974. This, this pretty much dates me, I guess. Uh, and I don't really remember a whole lot about the event, except somebody gave me one of those lollipops that had the cross sticks, and I thought that was extremely exotic. So this has lived in my memory. But, but I grew up marching on picket lines, and I remember my brother and I making these homemade banners to protest the re requirement that young men register for the draft when I was about 10, and we'd stand in front of the post office, that well-known symbol of uh, overreaching government authority, and <laughs> try to persuade young guys not to register, and nobody paid any attention to us. Uh, so, so for me, coming from that background, it um, really wasn't until I was in my mid-20s that I, circumstances in my life made me rethink my starting assumptions of, you know, the military should probably be disbanded, sooner the better. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. so. But having a, having a view of things doesn't always lead people to study of law. You obviously have a very natural love of the law. I mean, your, your writings speak to an enormous amount of research, which, which would be hard to do unless you really had it in your blood. What drew you to the law? Uh, I like many people actually ended up in the law by accident. I, I, I applied uh, to English PhD programs, anthropology PhD programs, public health programs, a business school, and a law school. And I was thinking about medical school, but my then boyfriend was going to law school, so I decided to go to law school with him. So that's not the answer you wanted, Link, but, 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 but then I learned to love it. As soon as I got there, I loved it. Biological determinism at its best. <laughs> Uh, and how did you and how did you how did you come into work for Michelle Flournoy in the Pentagon? So in the mid 1990s, uh, like many people in my generation, you know, I think I think for my parents' generation, the paradigmatic conflict was Vietnam, uh, and being part of the anti-war movement. For my generation, it was the ethnic conflicts of the 1990s sort of, mm -hmm. that really shaped our view of war, peace, the role of the military, and and for me. Um, those were the events that really challenged my own assumptions uh, and made me start thinking, oh, wait, maybe you do need military force sometime. And, and it also, working at the State Department in the late 90s during the Kosovo intervention, brought me into direct contact for the first time with lots of military officers who were working really hard to stop an ethnic cleansing campaign. Um, that then, that set of interests led to some scholarly work on post-conflict reconstruction, and the rule of law, which in turn led me to have a lot of uh, professional contacts with military lawyers, particularly in the Army JAG Corps, mm -hmm. uh, which was working on their own handbook on uh, rule of law uh, processes. And that in turn led me to when Michelle Flournoy, who I knew ever so slightly when she was nominated to be Under Secretary of Policy, I, I emailed her and I said, uh, I would love to work for you. And she, not knowing any better, said, um, sure. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> that was that. So you found yourself inside the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, suddenly exposed to an incredible uh, sort of kaleidoscope of very rich issues that you knew something about already. When did you know that, that, that I have to write about this, there's a book here. At what point did that sense come out? Not, while, you, while you were yeah. experiencing it or after you left? No, I, I mean, I had written about these issues for years. I had already been writing about these issues. Mm -hmm. The trouble is if you're a law professor, your bread and butter is writing about issues for law journals and 
Uh, no one, it turns out, reads law journals. Um, maybe your tenure committee, if you're very, very lucky, actually reads them, but no one else does. So I had been writing about them for years. And I think for me, what, what happened working at the Pentagon was it gave me a more acute sense of, I want to write about these issues in a, in a genre and way in which somebody might actually read it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I went back when I left the Pentagon, I went back to Georgetown Law, where, where I taught and had been on a public service leave, and I, I went to the dean, um, and I, I said, uh, a very nice man named Bill Trainer, and I said, Bill, I, I don't want to write any more law review articles, ever. And he looked a little crestfallen, since that is, in fact, what you are supposed to do as a faculty member. And he said, well, maybe you could write a book. And I said, yeah, I'll write a book. And then having said I would write a book, I had to write a book. Write a book. <laughs> OK. But having been a policymaker in the heart of Washington, the capital, the headquarters of the superpower of the world, could you ever see yourself going back into a policy role in government at any point? Um, it probably is not going to be in the next administration for reasons that you, having read the book, you can probably imagine. But um, I uh, ask. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I could. I could. Um, I mean, is that in your appetite? Is that sort of in the way you see what interests you to sort of get back and say, all right, my opinions yeah. will go this way. I'm going to try and sort of execute to on To some it. extent. I mean, as you know very well, the hardest thing, one of the hardest things about being in government is you have to censor yourself all the time because it's not about you. Uh, it's about representing the executive branch, and um, that's that's tough. Uh, that's that's tough for many people. It was tough for me. Huh. Um, I'm not obviously. If I did it again, I'd have to shut up again, and I'm not terribly good at that. No, I can relate. I, as an appointee in five administrations, I always thought that I was representing not only 330 million citizens. Yeah but everyone yet to come and everyone who had been part of the franchise who had brought us to this point, which helps you separate yourself from the, the passions of the bureaucracy a little bit, uh, particularly uh, things that you don't agree with. So let's, let's talk about drones, since you were the co-chairman of the Stimson Drone Commission. Um, the so-called drone war, which is shorthand, in what way did you s perceive this to be divorced from policy? That's sort of a shorthand comment, but you, you sort of said, at one point, that you're, you portrayed it as being somewhat off on its own track and on tangent and untethered. Yeah. Well, I think, and, and this is an issue, obviously, that, that you know very, very well uh, yourself, but I remember talking to um, a military uh, friend at the Pentagon years ago while I was still there, and he said uh, about U.S. Uh, uh, targeted strikes carried out mostly by drones, he said, this is a tactic in search of a strategy. Uh, and I think that, that, you know, five years later, that remains true. Um, that we continue, we, we, we have this technology that has enabled us to, with much greater ease and lower costs, uh, do things that we probably would have perceived as too high risk politically um, uh, if we didn't have this technology. And so we're using it, but we still, um, five years after someone said that to me, and, and two years, is it two years now after we released our right. Stimson Center Task Force report, uh, I think we still do not have any clear sense that the, uh, uh, the executive branch knows whether this is accomplishing any strategic goals. And my own sense is that it's probably doing the opposite. Yeah, they did release some legal documents heavily redacted on, in terms of the justification in August, uh, which I think was in response to the call for transparency. Right. Do, is there a line there that says, if we didn't have unmanned lethal drones, um, and we had to do it with either special forces or a, a manned pilot, uh, we wouldn't do it. Is that a line that exists? Is there an ethical I, line? I don't think there's any, uh, I mean, we, so we wrestled with this, obviously, when we were doing our drones task force, because I think on the one hand, we all felt quite strongly uh, that, that, you know, drones, it's just a technology, there's nothing magic about it that the ethical valence of deciding to kill someone isn't altered if you kill them by you know, dropping a missile from an unmanned vehicle versus a manned vehicle versus a sniper rifle versus a poisoned umbrella, mm -hmm. um, but that on, the, that on the other hand that the relevance of the particular technology was that it probably lowered the threshold for political decision making to actually go ahead and use force. So I do think, no question about it, that if 
that precisely the fact that these technologies enable us to have greater confidence that there won't be unintended civilian casualties and reduces the risk to our own personnel. Uh, if that weren't the case, if every time we wanted to go after a suspected terrorist, if we had to think, gee, this could kill 50 civilians and this could kill 50 U.S. service members, I think we probably would think a whole lot harder before doing it, and mm. we wouldn't do it as much. And you talk about the fact that we've taken off many of those sort of leading figures of the terrorist organizations, and now we're down to second and third tier figures. <laughs> the um, endless, endless round of number two yeah, and number three. I want to ask you about imminence, because that yeah. seems to be a very important principle in law. It's interesting. I was once in a situation room discussion with principals that had to do with maritime boarding mm. because there were people sort of fleeing one region to another right. and the rights of the ship captain to board change if mm -hmm. imminence is present. And I, and I tried to, as a layman, I was the only one in the room who knew this, so I was trying to explain it mm -hmm. to the National Security Advisor. It seems as though that with this tar targeted killing from drones, uh, the word imminence is sort of taking a different there's not quite the same clock running, if I could put it that way. What, have yeah. we stretched the meaning of imminence too far? We, we have. I mean, the concept itself is pretty straightforward, and in international law, traditionally, it's mirrored what we have in domestic criminal law and the law of self-defense. That if you know you don't get to you don't get to kill some you don't get to claim self-defense if you killed someone and get get exonerated. If you say, well, I knew that that guy was planning to kill me someday, so I decided I'd go murder him in his sleep. You know, that then you go to jail for murder. That if you want to be able to successfully plead self-defense, you generally have to be able to show that you reasonably believe that the life-threatening attack on you was was imminent. You know, he's in the act. He's about to. He's pulling his gun and pointing it at you. And the same has traditionally been true in international law. That that to use force mm -hmm. in national self-defense, you to do it against a a a threat that is imminent. What what has ended up happening and and. Technological developments have made this more challenging, right? That when, when imminence was that the foreign army is massed on your borders, obviously when you've got you know, ICBMs that can get there in a couple hours, mm -hmm. that, that does force a, a rethinking of some of those doctors. How long do you have to wait? Um, I think that we saw uh, this debate in the run-up to the Iraq war. Remember uh, George W. Bush's uh, metaphor of um, you know, do we have to wait for the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud? And can we act in preventive self-defense? But, but, but the sort of weird new twist, which I actually think is kind of Orwellian, um, which, which came out in a leaked 2011 Justice Department memo on uh, uh, the justification for killing U.S. citizens. Anwar Al-Awlaki was the, was the sort of raison d'etre for this memo. Um, made a completely topsy-turvy argument about imminence and essentially said, when it comes to terrorists, the nature of terrorists is that they are always plotting against us. But it is their nature that we cannot know what their, what their next move will be. We just know that they will always be plotting against us and it will be something. And we don't know when and we don't know what. We don't know how big. And therefore, we will presume that the threat is always imminent and we are always justified in using force because we don't know when it's going to be, which is a, just from a sort of common understanding of language perspective, totally eliminates any meaning of the word imminence if you're saying the fact that we don't know anything means that we define it as imminent. It also, from a, from a sort of law of armed conflict perspective, means that in a sort of traditional use of force law framework, you're supposed to make sure that your own use of force is, is proportionate to the threatened use of force that you're trying to prevent. But if by definition, the nature of terrorism is such that by definition you do not know and you cannot know what level of attack is coming against you, then you have no metric for evaluating how much force is proportionate when you don't know anything. So, so it, it kind of takes this legal framework that is not perfect but has some meaning and by redefining the word imminent renders it useless in a sense because what can you say to that? And we're getting so precise now, not always, which is a different okay. subject, but when we do just get one person, um, you've sort of said this is moving us into a zone that approximates assassination rather than sort of war. Is What's the difference? Yeah, so I mean it's a really interesting question, right? And, and these are, these are uh, concepts we come up with, we can change them, but, but when you think about war, when you think about armed conflict, 
and I remember I write about this a little bit in the book. I, I remember thinking about this, looking at this uh, old photograph that uh, my great grandmother died a few years ago, and I got a whole bunch of old photos. And one of the photos that ended up in my hands was this old black and white photograph of uh, a group of young men on the eve of World War One. They were Canadian soldiers. My great grandmother lived in British Columbia, and uh, you know it was a group portrait. They were about to be shipped off to to Europe, um, and on the back, it, it she listed all of their names and their fates, and you know, killed by a machine gun and so on, and, and their fates were not not good. Let me tell you. And I and I sort of thought, boy, what a difference, right? We we picture these guys; it's trench warfare, and nobody's shooting at them because you know you're so and so uh, from British Columbia. You know that the Germans are shooting at them because they're Allied soldiers, period, and they're shooting back for the same reason. You know, and that we think of war as being very impersonal. But that our technologies, the combination of precision, precision weapons technologies with our intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance technologies, have meant that increasingly we can we're sort of personalizing and individualizing warfare. That 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 much of the time we're not saying let's just get that guy because he's a bad guy. We're saying we're saying so and so who we've been tracking for weeks or months or years we know where he went to university we know who he's married to we know his children's names we know you know whether he likes to play soccer on Saturdays or not mm -hmm. and we're targeting him because he's him which you know it, it's complex I think it's ethically not I don't think it's simple right because on the one hand and I sometimes say this to my friends in the human rights community you don't like targeted killing do you prefer untargeted killing because that's what we used to do mm -hmm. right Hiroshima you know firebombing of Dresden that's that's untargeted killing and it is surely better obviously surely it is an ethically better world if we can just target one bad guy and not take out scores of thousands of innocent people on the other hand, it does start making it look uncomfortably like not war, but murder, right? When you're going after that guy or that guy or that guy preemptively, which is what we're doing, or assassination, if you will. So well, let me circle back to how you treat enemy combatants, because the debate raged after 9-11 as to um, what do we do with these people. Uh, there actually was a Geneva Convention issue when they first got right. the captives in Kandahar. They couldn't warm them up. Or, or give them any comfort because that, then they couldn't re relocate them. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, it was considered that once you start to create any kind of a facility, you have no legal right to move them to another facility for your own convenience. So, so they froze a few nights before they could fly out to Cuba. Um, just a small factoid. But the question is, are we, uh, you know, the argument was made, we don't know how long the war on terrorism could last. It could last many, many years, and therefore are they POWs until that time, and therefore should we treat them as well as possible and not, or as we had a, a ranking a member of Congress say the other day in this chair, um, criminal law is perfectly adequate to deal with all of these issues. What's your take on that? Well, I think criminal law is adequate to deal with most of the issues, not all of them. Um, obviously, uh, whether you're looking at ordinary U.S. criminal law or whether you're looking at the, the law of armed conflict and international criminal law, uh, you can prosecute someone for war crimes uh, under international criminal law. We've done it. We can prosecute people for war crimes under U.S. domestic law. We have our own War Crimes mm -hmm. Act, which mirrors international law. Um, uh, I think to the extent that we have detainees who we believe have committed crimes, as is the case frequently, um, you know, there is no bar to prosecuting them mm -hmm. except in a very small number of circumstances where, for instance, evidence was obtained by torture uh, or what a U.S. court would consider torture, and that's really a problem of our own making, obviously. Um, I think that there is a very small number of people uh, who were detained and against whom we do not have evidence of specific crimes. Um, but we regard as dangerous. Uh, there is the only framework that permits you to detain people on sort of danger, dangerous grounds in international law, you know, is essentially their enemy combatants, and you could detain them for the duration of the conflict. But the, that's obviously a legal framework that is predicated on the belief that conflicts tend to have ends that come sort of in somebody's lifetime. You know, that that maybe it doesn't come. Maybe it's not five years. Maybe it's eight. Maybe it's not eight, maybe it's even 15, but it's not forever. So the, the framework ask, is causing a problem. Well, let me ask it a different way. If you had statistics that showed that, that of the detainees sort of released back to home countries, 
a certain percentage of them kept committing attempted aggression against the U.S. and the West, would that statistic bear no. on whether you treat the, the remaining ones no. as enemy combatants? No, I mean, uh, we, it's just a core principle of international and domestic law. You know, when you have served your sentence, you have served your sentence if you were criminally convicted. Yes, you might go out and commit another crime. That's a risk society takes because we think it is better to take that risk than to have the precedent of we lock you up based on your hypothetical future acts. So but if recidivism rates are very high in domestic uh, law, don't, don't people change sentencing guidelines? Sure, but, the, but you, don't, you can't do it retroactively. You can't just hang yeah, for, on to right. somebody. You can't just hang on to somebody forever on the grounds that you think maybe they would do something. You know, I also think, I mean, I think we get, we have this myth, um, and, and, and it's, I totally get why we have it right after 9-11, right? We had this horrific act. Thousands of people are dead. You know, we're shocked, we're scared. Um, but we developed this myth of sort of the terrorist mastermind, you know, who who is capable of carrying out more 9-11 attacks, you know, at the drop of a hat. And we, we let that really distort our law because, in fact, you know, yet has there been recidivism amongst former U.S. detainees? Yes, there has. Uh, has it been a significant threat to the United States strategically? No, it really has not. You know, and even during World War II, we had some prisoner exchanges with Nazi Germany. Those were bad guys. You know, but, but in all of our previous conflicts, we let go of some really bad guys who went on to fight us again because that is something that you do during conflicts. And that is something in criminal law as well. When people serve their sentences, you let them go. You don't, you don't keep them because of what they might do. You know, I also think, and this is a somewhat separate issue, I also think, and you know, particularly with regard to these few poor remaining guys in Guantanamo, there's, there's some very bad ones, but most of them are not. You know, the, the majority of the poor schmoes who are still there should not have been there in the first place. And even the very bad ones, if we let those guys go, I once, I once wrote a slightly tongue-in-cheek mm -hmm. column, uh, but not totally tongue-in-cheek, in which I sort of said, let them go, give them 10,000 bucks, tuck a bunch of CIA business cards in their pocket, uh, take a whole bunch of pictures you put on the internet shaking their hands and thanking them for their many years of help. Uh, and then you surveil the hell out of them. They're not; those guys are not going to be trusted by anybody, and they are going to be the most closely monitored human beings in the world. And if they succeed in doing something that hurts us, that is our fault at that point, you know. So one of the themes of the book is is sort of how the world's changing in so many ways. And I wanted to ask you about your reference to future war, uh, killer robots, ultra secret cyber tools, bioweapons that could degrade human capacity. Um, do these fall under sort of the permissible acts of war? Are there, are there any sort of problems with the law of war, the Geneva Conventions, or other, uh, other sort of long-standing norms that these, these raise? And I'll give, you, I'll give you one just because I handled the landmine issue mm -hmm. for many years and was involved with an NGO that helped the, the, the people who had limb loss victims from landmine accidents. And you talk about how humans make errors, particularly as you just described in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, I, I was part of a whole group of people that probably made a lot of errors, um, and, and to err is human. And, but you could program robots autonomously uh, to do the right thing or to do what you've programmed to do very reliably. Um, how is that different from putting landmines uh, across a field that you don't want anyone to cross? And if someone steps in that landmine, it's a, it could be a cow that supports a farmer. It could be the farmer's daughter, but it works. Uh, so I just want to <coughs> sound you out on these future weapons, well, and what does that yeah. say about yeah. uh, the frameworks that we have in place? No, I, I think that there are all kinds of ways in which some of the technologies that we've developed in recent years and that are under development that are around the corner will make it hard to apply some of our old rules. Um, that being said, I, I think that... Um, I'm less concerned than, than many are about the sort of idea of, sort of autonomous killer robots running around. Um, and that's partly because they are very different from landmines, right? The landmine can't tell the difference. It has no mechanism. It's, the landmine is not, have, is not artificially intelligent, right? It is just a dumb thing that responds to somebody stepping on it, essentially. Right. Um, and uh, the kinds of, the kind the, the sort of the bogeyman that people worried about uh, the development of autonomous uh, weapon systems they worry about is 
sort of artificially intelligent, you know, robot killer that goes berserk and turns against all humanity. Um, I'm not that. I mean, I'm not that worried about that. And part of the reason I'm not that worried about that, and I, I remember being at a conference a few years ago where somebody said, you know, in sort of agonized tones, oh, you know, it's a fundamental law of armed conflict obligation to distinguish between, you know, civilians and combatants, and to not, you know, you can't shoot the civilians. And how could we entrust such a critical decision to a to an artificially intelligent machine? Don't we have an ethical obligation to have humans make these decisions? And my reaction to that was like, humans are terrible at making those decisions. We're horrible. Our record at distinguishing between civilians and combatants is awful because we get scared. We panic. You know, we don't have eyes in the back of our heads. We can't see, you know, we can't process too much information at once. We're horrible at it. I actually have, just as it turns out that the, you know, driverless cars are shaping up to be a lot better than us human drivers, um, I actually, you know, do I love the idea of having the autonomous robot make the decisions? No. Do I think humans do it better? Absolutely not. We're horrible at it. Maybe we have an ethical obligation to turn the wars all over to the robots. <laughs> they're going to be better at complying with the law of well, war. If you've, if you've seen the, the Google cars in Palo Alto, they, they, they're very careful and they have tons of sensors. And they're very polite. Yeah, they are right. very polite. Uh, they actually look very promising. I totally want to hand it all over to the robots. I mean, ironically, maybe this is a different problem, but one of the ones that I focus on, sort of the, the decision to escalate to nuclear mm -hmm. use or the decision, frankly, to respond to a threat in space in the future where we actually know that something happened in less than mm -hmm. a, a day. I mean, uh, attribution and knowledge is, is a very slow process, but in the future we'll know that somebody's going after our satellites, we think we know who it was, and there'll be some four star or two star, no offense General Ham, who's going to be uh, saying, Mr. President, you don't have time. The whole constellation's gonna be burned up in 90 minutes. I need pre-delegated authority. Um, and I have posited a doctrine that says no president will ever authorize, and that could change depending on the election, but will ever authorize something uh, that he or she doesn't understand uh, the consequences. But uh, so that's one where it's actually restraint. It's a slender read. With, with you know, sort of presidents wanting to control the action yeah. at the highest level as opposed to sort of yeah. pre excessively pre delegating. So we seem to be moving yeah. almost in two directions with that. No, I, I think, and, and I think that humans will always want to hold on to decision making. And I think we see it in our in our resistance to driverless cars and I think we see it we see it within the military itself in terms of a lot of unease within the military about autonomous weapon systems and and believing that humans need to be in the loop. I think that we're not what we're not very good at is sort of asking ourselves, do we want humans in the loop because we are actually convinced that humans make better decisions or do we like humans in the loop because, you know, we're the humans uh, and we like being in the loop. Um, I, I I do not, it's not that I attribute an enormous amount of wisdom to, to uh, artificially intelligent machines, it's just that I, I don't have a particularly high opinion of our, of our human brains. <laughs> well, that may be a good segue. I don't want to, I don't want to miss the opportunity just to, to touch on the subject of torture, mm -hmm. which is an important subject in your book, and I, I urge everyone to read it, and I'm sure some people came today who've already read it, they just want you to sign their book. It's, um, but. There was, a, there was a passionate disagreement. You felt very strongly about the sort of legal arguments that were being waged. <coughs> what, is, what should policy take away, policy experts take away from your observations of the, of the process that you witnessed on the subject of defining torture and, and keeping US use of force legal and legitimate? Boy, it's a hard question. I mean, uh, I think that um, one takeaway should be and, and I wrote a piece about this uh, earlier in the year when there was a debate about uh, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump saying, you know, I would order waterboarding and more. Um, not only that, I would, I would say, take out the terrorist families, the only way to, and, and people were saying, uh, but, but that would be a war crime, the military wouldn't follow your orders, and he said, you know, I'm a leader, they'll follow my orders. Um, and there was this wave of uh, people saying, you know, oh no, the military would never follow orders to commit war crimes, and 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 I remember thinking at the time, and I wrote something about this in a in a uh, post op ed at the time that, um, in some ways, what the torture debate shows us is, sure, if you go to any military official uh, worth his or her salt and say, I order you to commit war crimes, they're going to say, no, are you kidding? Of course not. But that's not the way these things work, right? That what instead happens is that somebody goes to a bunch of lawyers and says, um, you know, 
Uh, are there any circumstances in which it would be lawful for me to target these children of terrorists? I think they're material supporters, or I think that they're whatevers, or I think that they're all combatants, or you know, and they pose an imminent threat. And is there any, you know, waterboarding? I, you know, I'm pretty sure it's not torture. And you get a whole bunch of lawyers to come up with a lot of long bits of legal analysis that say this is not, in fact, torture, and it is not, in fact, you know, uh, uh, attacking civilian targets, which would, which would, of course, be a war crime. And so then the, the eventual order is attack these targets or, or interrogate these people in this fashion. If anybody says, well, wait, wait, but I thought we couldn't do that because it was against the law, they'll say, oh, no, no, it's not against the law. Don't worry. You know, it's not torture. It's fine. It's, you know, so, 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 so I think my takeaway from that was that, uh, you know, watch out for the lawyers. Um, watch out for the lawyers and don't let, don't let the legal analysis displace your own moral compass. I can't believe I'm about to try to defend lawyers, but <laughs> <laughs> before we started the drone uh, task force here at Stimson, I went to a conference that Notre Dame held in Chicago and they'd invited some senior leaders from Washington, but they also had ethicists and religious law scholars, humanitarian law experts from all over Europe and and it was, a, it was a very strong group of experts. And the themes that emerged from that had nothing to do with my experience in Washington. So I will just say something to you and get your reaction. As someone who was very steeped in the law of war before you went into the government and then saw the way it was handled inside government, I guess what I would say is these are hardworking people who, who, who bring two things to the table. One, they want to make sure that all the, about lawyers? all the, excuse me? Lawyers? We're talking about lawyers? Lawyers. Oh, those, yeah. Government lawyers. They basically, there's so many processes that have yeah. to do with, you know, export controls and, <clears throat> and this and that, uh, classification, um, that had nothing to do with the issue of is it torture or not. They, they want to sort of check off on, on all the authorization bills and make sure that, that mm -hmm. they're inside yeah. those lines. That's their expertise. Uh, and secondly, they obviously don't want to cross, they, they want to try to get to yes under any circumstance short of, um, whatever that upper limit is that says I have to fall on my sword and tell my boss that you can't do that, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a rare thing. They always try to get to yes. So I, I want to sort of, that's the sociology of the government. But they're not lawyers who sit on the outside studying ethics and, and sort of the, hist the history yeah. of justice in law and the things that you knew when you went in. Um, is there a culture problem here within, among the legal community? Instead of sort of saying they're wrong, is there some way to broaden the legal culture in Washington so they're a little more open to those wavelengths of international informed opinion on, on the law of war? Uh, you know, there's, there was a big debate actually partly because of the uh, uh, debate about torture and enhanced interrogation and so forth. There's that, that created a big debate about the big debate about the role of executive branch lawyers and you know, who is your client, is your client is your client the government official who said, I want your legal opinion, or is your client the Constitution, is your client the nation? Right. Um, and it's certainly true, I think, that the ethical obligation of a lawyer in private practice, you know, I'm representing you when you're accused of a crime, right. that my ethical obligation to you is crystal clear and spelled out very clearly, very clearly in legal codes of ethics. My obligation to you, if I'm in the general counsel's office at DOD and you are an assistant secretary, is much less clear. Um, and, and, and I do think that that is perhaps part of the problem, is that executive branch lawyers often think of themselves as if they were representing you as, as, as a criminal defense lawyer when, when, in fact, their role is designed to be somewhat different. Um, I, you know, I think it's a hard problem, right? I think mm -hmm. it's not unnatural for lawyers to think, you're my client, I want to make it possible for you to do what you want to do. I think there's an even deeper problem, and, and part of what the book talks about this, I actually think torture is an easy one, in mm -hmm. a sense, right? The prohibition was clear. I think that it was bad lawyering. It was, it was bad, sloppy, to, and unethical lawyering that led to legal decisions that said, oh, it's fine. I think that a lot of the issues that we're facing today are not like that. Um, you know, I think that issues about things like the, the, the legality of targeted strikes against a U.S. citizen, I don't think the law is clear at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in fact, and this is a big, one of the biggest subjects of the book, the, the, the biggest problem with, with uh, in that context, applying the law of armed conflict is the one thing the law of armed conflict never does is define an armed conflict. So once you know that you're applying it, 
the rules become very clear, but we can't decide anymore really when and whether and under what circumstances and to whom to apply it. That's a whole different kind of problem. You know, that's not the, hey, you could put 100 lawyers in a room and 99 of them would say, yeah, waterboarding is torture. And they would have, right? It was a, you know, a, few, a few sloppy lawyers in important positions who led you to the 1% answer. But I think the problems we're facing today are of a different character. Mm -hmm. And you could put 100 lawyers in it. I've sat in rooms with this, this 100 lawyers, basically. I've sat in many, many rooms in the last 15 years with really, really smart lawyers who work for the US government, who work for allied governments, who work for the UN, who work for NGOs, who are in private practice, who are in universities. And they all go around in circles about the same issues over and over and can't reach any conclusion. And that's a different kind of problem. Is it really a legal question at the end of the day that they can't resolve? Yeah. I, I think at the end of the day, I, at the end of the day, when your legal frameworks just don't fit reality very well, no. I it, mean, then they have to give it to political risk. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So it is a political. Your pen decision. was very sharp as you, throughout the book. It got even sharper, if I may say, when one lawyer introduced the notion that his position represented the defense of the president's inherent right under Article Two. And yet, as a practitioner, I've actually been, I've, I've run into situations negotiating with 140 countries of the UN where I was being asked to say yes to something that would have set a precedent constraining the entire history of the presidency in terms of the ambit of, and I've heard these arguments, I wrote War Powers testimony in, in the 80s on a, pra, on a pragmatic basis, not a legal basis. And so I'm not unfamiliar with that, those arguments from the Associate Attorney General's office. And, not being an executive branch royalist anymore. I actually think we should converge with Congress and call it the home team and see what that does for our country. Yeah, good luck. But, but I want to ask you, is that the argument that offends you the most? Or, or isn't it everything but? I mean, can't you, can you set that aside, that presidential Article II powers in this uncertain future you've painted probably need to be fairly undefined, and he's the agent. You know, we, eminence is getting closer. Right. Uh, response times are shorter. Uh, process is important, and you have to hope that you have a good president if it's a matter of seconds. But isn't, isn't the problem with the law sort of definable even short of, of that problem? Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. I, I do think that there's nothing inherently wrong with an expansive interpretation of the president's inherent Article II powers when you have the other branches of government functioning the way they're supposed to, right? Because the Constitution, you know, our, our government system by design does not spell out the precise limits of executive power or of congressional power or of judicial power. You know, that the, that the framers design it that way on purpose to have somewhat overlapping spheres of authority on the theory that the other two branches would always check overreaching by, by a third. Is that um, in danger in the world? That, that I think is in danger, yeah. And I, and I do think that I, I do think that what we've seen, and you see this in the debate about the uh, 2001 uh, authorization to use military force, um, that when you, have a, when you have Congress kind of lying down on the job and the courts unable or unwilling to, to wade in, in some cases unable because of prior mm -hmm. congressional uh, jurisdiction limiting legislation, then you have a problem when you have presidents who are willing to expansively interpret their executive power. Um, so I don't so much blame the executive branch for, for trying, right? What, whatever you get, if you're the president, that's what you're going to do. It's going to be your job. But you want the other branches to be doing their job, too. Okay. Now, I'm conscious of the time, and I'm conscious that there's a great open bar waiting and books to be signed and people who want to talk to you. So I'm going to sort of move to the kind of concluding the big issues. I, you, you, have, you, you cite Kofi Annan's warnings that some of these, um, the kind of erosion of the World War II era concepts of sovereignty uh, it represent a, sip, a slippery slope and that some expedient legal interpretations can pave the way for uh, losing, losing our, our, our ability to have a, a functioning system among states and that there may be some role for a global referee. And So I guess my first big question is, uh, can the Westphalian system um, sort of restore its primacy in a way that's consistent with individual empowerment, transnational movement, globalization writ large, all the things that have happened, uh, instant information, 
et cetera, where governments don't have a monopoly of what they used to have, where you know, Abdul Nasser had one microphone and the FDR had one radio broadcast and, and could command millions, the attention of millions, that's gone. But I mean, is the Westphalian system sailing away irrevocably? You'll really make me sad if the answer is yes. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not right? ready to I, mean, give it up. I mean, what we do know, obviously, is that uh, states are facing more and more competition, that, that technological changes have enabled uh, non state actors and even, even perhaps individuals to harness lethal force in a way that previously we would have assumed only states could do, um, and that there are, there are competitors for lethal force too, right? That we, when we think about potential, few, we haven't had any cyber Pearl Harbor, maybe we never will, but we face, a, we face a future in which the technologies, at least in theory, exist that would enable uh, even a small number of individuals to really cause havoc for states. Um, there's nothing new about this, we all know this, um, when we are looking also at threats such as the impact of climate change or, or potential epidemic diseases or threats to the global financial system. Uh, no state can address these threats by their own. That the, the autonomy of every single state is dramatically reduced in terms of its ability to, to solve the problems that face it. Whether there have been a lot of pronouncements in the last 20 years about the death of the state and obviously they're not dead yet, um, and they, they, you know, like their reports of their deaths have been greatly exaggerated, they're still here. Um, would it surprise me if in the next 50 years some states do go away, and we instead start seeing more of a kind of Brexit notwithstanding, sort of super EU-like super states, um, federal systems, which of course is what the US originally was as well, mm -hmm. you know, and do we instead see kind of, you know, 15 different clusters of multiple states that most of the time act in concert. I don't know. I think it, it is anybody's guess. But in the past, I mean, I was a stamp collector as a little kid. There was the United Arab Republic, Libya, Syria, Egypt, um, where they threw in together. I, that the, yeah. You could see that. But I mean, states have privileges. They have diplomatic immunity. They have the pouch. They have flags. They have national anthems. They have armies. Um, and, and they have currency. Are those privileges, what happens if that starts yeah. to get eroded? I know we have Bitcoin and a few other challenges. Does that mean we just simply say, well, we're, we're, we're not in this era anymore, so we should race further toward armed non-state actors, Bitcoin, and... and well, uh, you know, I mean, that's world, what no states world. were in the first place, right? They were armed non-state actors that were sufficiently successful that they became states. Um, you know, that's, that's where we get states. So, so. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't think there's anything that should make us either feel like, oh, hooray, we can't wait for all existing states to be gone, or that should make us feel like, oh, it would be so sad if the state disappears as a primary form of social organization. You know, as you know, it's, it's, it's throughout history, we've seen a lot of different kinds of political and social organizations that have been successful mm -hmm. for certain periods of time. We're already in a world in which, in which we may, on paper, have, I forget whatever number it is of states we're up to right now, um, 192 or maybe. something like yeah. that. Um, you know, not all of them do have armies. Some of them delegate their defense to others. You know, not all of them do have borders that they have any ability to control. Some of them don't bother or they delegate that to others. You know, that, that we already have plenty of states that have decided that sovereignty is kind of a chumps game. You know, and then in fact that you get richer and more prosperous if you give up some of your sovereign attributes to other states. You know, I, I think that the, the, the trend line suggests that more small states are going to do it. We're going to see more consolidation. That after a period in sort of post-World War II era, we've seen tremendous fragmentation and a proliferation of states, some of which have no ability to be self-sustaining in any meaningful way. And I think that the sort of technological trend line may now be pushing us in the, op in the opposite direction, back towards a kind of consolidation as the little the little states that can't can't function viably in that model give up and, and and I think it will be really interesting to see whether some of today's bad non-state actors eventually morph into boring boring old states. Well, th that alone is a reason for you to read this book um, the, the, because you're a good historian and you that makes you a a really interesting futurologist, whatever the word is, and I've seen you speak in other venues as well, saying this is the way things are moving, this is, everything's changing, and people who are very much 
stakeholders in the status quo and trying to manage the status quo don't think that way. They can't. It's not, the, it's not their job. And so it's interesting to be challenged by, by your perspective. So, so you talk about I'll, the last question, if I may, and then we'll, we'll throw you to your fans. Um, you propose developing some new rules and institutions to accommodate a changing world. Um, the, the, the thought of permanent management instead of episodic denial of the condition that we're calling war. And so I guess my question is, can you just give us a sense of, if you could sort of, if you were sort of uh, able to make the changes that would, that would address everything you write about, <laughs> what would be the scope of, of evolution of legal doctrine, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of sort of who, who, what would be the sort of coin of the realm in terms of, of sovereignty and legitimacy? We, we have a strong UN program here at Stimson. I've always thought that the UN's strength rested on the member states' ability and willingness to support it, that it didn't have an autonomous sense of, of, of sustenance, and, and it was an agent of member states. But I wanted to ask you, what kind of a world should we be moving toward? Can you sort of paint a picture of a better legal framework, a better structure? Well, there, there are two big pieces to that question. Um, um, the first, I think, relates to the, the law, law of war and that legal framework. Um, um, and right now, I think the big problem is that we, we have a kind of a binary legal framework for a non-binary world, you know, that, that our legal framework is very much on-off. Uh, the, the legal term for the law of armed conflict is, is lex specialis, which is the fancy Latin term for special law. Uh, as opposed to the lex generalis, the general law, and the idea is that in general, most of the time, ordinary state of affairs, you have the lex generalis, and then in special circumstances, the unique and temporary exceptional state of war, you apply this different set of rules. Uh, so, you know, it's on or off. You know, you're either on, in the, you're in the war, or you're not the rest of the time. And that framework makes a lot of sense when you conceptualize wars as temporary and bounded geographically uh, in time, et cetera. When you're in the world that we're in today, where I think, you know, and obviously one of the things that the military has been struggling to think about, both from a doctrinal perspective and in terms of training, in, ter in terms of uh, just across the spectrum of operations, what do you do when you have a, a spectrum of conflict? Uh, and you're not necessarily neatly either in peace or in war. Um, so I think operationally, we know that most of the time we're operating, we're not over here and we're not over here. We're kind of somewhere in the middle. But legally, we still have a framework that says either you're here or you're here. Pick one. Um, and I think that on that issue, the, the, the answer, you know, again, it's not that complicated. You know, we sometimes make this seem more complicated than it is. You know, the, the legal frameworks we have are relatively recent vintage, um, you know, that they really date from the post-World War II era. Uh, they were intended to accomplish a particular set of objectives. If they're not accomplishing them, we can change them. There's no particular reason that we can't have rules for that murky gray zone where we're mostly operating. And a lot of the conundrums that we face today when we think about things like, oh gosh, how should we think about you know, US targeted strikes by drone or whatever, poisoned umbrella, if you will, doesn't matter, um, is because if we think, aha, it's an armed conflict in Yemen and that guy's combatant, well then there's nothing morally or legally different if we use a drone to kill that guy than if it's the beaches at Normandy and we're shooting, you know, an American soldier shooting at a German soldier, there's, there's nothing new here. On the other hand, if we think, wait a minute, it doesn't seem, that doesn't seem like the right framework, well then it's extrajudicial execution. And those are our two choices, right? The only two choices we have. And I think most of us have a pretty powerful intuition that those shouldn't be the only two choices that we have, that there should be you know, a, set of, a set of rules and a set of procedures and a set of safeguards that are more appropriate to that middle ground in which we find ourselves. And we talked about this a bit in the report we did on drones, for instance. But um, I think the, the other set of issues that you raise, which is a, is a harder one, a much harder one, I don't think I have you know, anything close to a good answer, which relates to what happens internationally in terms of rules about use of force in the first place, not about what you do when you're in an armed conflict, but uh, you know, who decides when to use force, under what circumstances. Mm -hmm. If we think that states are diminishing in relative power and sovereignty has been chipped away at, what alternative do we have? I don't have the faintest idea. 
Um, you know, I wish I did, right? Um, I mean, I think that we, we have, for a variety of technological reasons and ethical reasons, we, we have seen sovereignty both in, in actuality and as a legal category has been chipped away at very substantially, and, and the U.S. has been one of the chippers, right? We've chipped away at it legally for national security reasons when we say, hey, we reserve the right to take unilateral military action uh, if we think that there is a threat emanating from inside another sovereign state and we feel that that state's government is unwilling or ab unable to take appropriate action, we're saying we don't really care about your sovereignty. Um, and when we say, w when we're, you know, the human rights community says, oh, hey, if there's a genocide and the state is unwilling or able to take appropriate action to protect its population, then other states have the right and perhaps the obligation to intervene. We're also chipping away at the legal idea of sovereignty. And you know, the problem when you chip away at it enough, when you chip away enough at international legal norms against the unilateral use of force, whether it's for self-defense or whether it is for humanitarian purposes, well, then you're right back in the situation you're in before World War II when the presumption is just that states use force when they decide to use force. And that didn't get us anywhere good the last time around. Um, so I think that we're, we're at a very dangerous moment, um, one in which the the legitimacy, the, the ethical legitimacy of rules uh, that limit unilateral use of force and preserve stability, the ethical legitimacy of those norms has, has really been called into question, but we don't have an alternative. You know, in the UN Charter, as you know, the UN Charter originally was much more world government oriented and utopian than it, than the actual institution ended up being, and you know, remember until you know, in the mid-1940s, FDR and Winston <coughs> Churchill would talk cheerfully about, we need world government, and everybody's like, yeah. You know, and today, people say that, like, ha, 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 don't be ridiculous, but, but the UN Charter itself originally contained a provision for what was assumed to be a standing UN army, that the idea was not that states would, if they felt like it, contribute you know, already formed units into peacekeeping operations, but that states were going to cough up humans who would go places at the UN's command. That never happened. It never happened because, the, you know, before the ink was dry on the charter, all the states had second thoughts and thought, well, I don't, I'm not so sure about that. Um, and, and that, you know, that instinct, which is, of course, also understandable, and the Cold War is already getting underway, and states are going, oh, not if the, not if the Soviets are on the, you know, it, it get, that gets stillborn, but the, the logic that led to that in the 1940s is in, any, in many ways unchanged, and we're still struggling with that same basic dilemma, that we don't trust each other enough to be willing to let our fellow states or, citizen, or, or citizens of the world make those decisions about the use of force, but we are right to have an instinct that we can't necessarily trust ourselves to get it right all the time either. Wow. Well, as someone who's not a robot but hardwired as an optimist, um, I find my reaction to the book, and ever, all of you will have your own reaction, I find that as you describe this netherworld between the on and the off, and you're right about doctrine, I've sat at TRADOC and looked at how they look at phase zero, one, two, three, four, post-conflict, pre-conflict, and they say that now it, they're both going on at the same time. There is a phase of sort of hostility at all phases of conflict. We have to manage that. And when we had people in our full interagency teams in Afghanistan and Iraq, you had the issue was we can't do development, we can't do assistance, we can't do civil society building unless we have some security. It's sort of the, so, so the question then becomes, can we get you to write the next one to tell us how to resolve these legal issues. So, because I think the reason that TRADOC is looking at this, the Army Command, and the reason that the governments are looking at this problem is not to sort of observe and say, oh, gee, history is passing us by. They're saying, how do we improve on the situation? And as someone who takes a, a very long view, you've pointed out that there's a lot fewer people being killed in the world today, proportionately, and there's a lot more metrics that actually show that, that populations are developing to a much greater extent than before. There's a lot of fragile states, there's a lot of problems. So the question then becomes, if the, if the proposition is how do we take what's good and try to fix what's not so good, uh, I hope we can count on Rosa Brooks to write the book that will straighten out all of these cantankerous lawyers who are fl flitting around in different directions. 
you have given us just an enormous amount of wisdom and a lot to think about. I urge you all to go out there, grab your book, get some wine, and join me no, in thanking don't, Rosa. Don't grab your book. Buy your book. Is that a discount? Get a discount. Buy it here at Stimson. Oh, that's right. The Stimson discount. Yeah. Yeah. I'm relying on all the people in the audience to write the next book. And the Congratulations next book and thank you, Rosa. Well done.